Good evening. Hi, everyone. Glad to have you. We'll be starting in just a few moments. Uh, just letting everyone get in from the waiting room into the into the main area here for our talk. Um, while you're waiting, uh, there is a handout that's been posted. If you look on the on the the webinar control panel on the right side of your screen, you'll see a little handout, and you can click that and download that. And that's information about our next talk. Our next online talk will be in two weeks uh, on Tuesday, March 22nd. And it's sort of a follow-up talk uh, partnering with this talk um, to, I think you'll be find that very interesting also. So welcome everyone. Uh, we'll be starting uh, just in a few more minutes. We just wanted to let some people in early that have been waiting, letting them get in. So glad to have you here tonight. Yes, we'll be starting in for those just coming in. Uh, we're just uh, going to leave a few more minutes for everyone to get into the talk <clears throat> before we start off. And uh, if you just joined us, there is a handout that is a uh, part of the Go to webinar control panel. Uh, if you see that down by the chat, you can uh, click on that and download the information for our next talk, which is in two weeks on uh, March 22nd, also at 7.30, another online talk by Dr. Richard Reddy, sort of a follow-up talk to this talk. <clears throat> Glad to have you tonight. And uh, we're just gonna give it two more minutes here. Maybe three, we'll see. Just letting people get in from the waiting room. Glad to have you. <clears throat> Good evening, we'll be starting in just a few minutes here. <clears throat> if you want, while you're waiting, if you'll just look at your GoToWebinar control panel, if you're not familiar with it, if you can just look down um, during the talk, uh, we will be um, getting questions in um, for Kathy to answer after the talk. And uh, you can, if you can find the part of the control panel where it says questions, you can click on that and put your question in um, so Kathy can answer it once she's done with her talk. There's also uh, another section where you can raise your hand and if we see that you've raised your hand, then after the talk, we can um, have you unmute yourself and ask your question for Kathy. Glad to have you. Just waiting a few more minutes for those who've just joined us. Got a number of people more waiting to come in to the talk tonight. Glad you're here. So one more minute and then I think we'll uh, get going um, while you're waiting. For those who just came in, uh, you can look at your control panel and, and uh, see all the different parts to it. Uh, there's a place that you can um, click on that says questions. And while Kathy's talking, if you have a question that you'd like her to answer once the talk's over, feel free to put the, your question into the question box so that we can have her answer that after the talk. Also, if you notice there is a handout um, that's near the chat. And if you want to click on that, you can download some information about our next talk, um, which will be a follow-up talk to tonight's talk that you probably will find interesting also. Okay, just a few more seconds here and we'll get going. Thank you so much for joining us.
Okay, well, let's get going. Welcome. Good evening. We're so glad that you've joined us tonight. Uh, Gallatin Valley Earth Day is thrilled and we're honored to have Dr. Kathy Whitlock with us tonight to talk about climate change in Greater Yellowstone's watershed. My name is Ann Reddy and I'm the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee. Gallatin Valley Earth Day's theme this year is celebrating water stewardship, past, present, and future. We chose this theme both because 2022 is the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act and because we are facing some difficult challenges with our water right now and in the future. In fact, the paper, if you got the Bozeman Daily Chronicle today, um, the headline um, top article here is called High and Dry Snowpack. It says snowpack lacking in Southwest Montana after dry February. Um, and our unprecedented drought, a warming climate and pollution in our rivers are all issues we are facing, facing us today. The future also holds concerns. Um, the city of Bozeman estimates that we will not have enough water for a growing population by 2033. So with this in mind, we are glad you've joined us to learn how a warming climate will impact our snow and water supply and who better to help us but Dr. Kathy Whitlock. Before we do, I wanted to thank our premier sponsors for this event, Gallatin Subaru, Volkswagen of Bozeman, and the City of Bozeman, and our steward sponsors, Sacagawea Audubon Society, Bridger Bowl, and Happy Trash Can. Without their generous support, we would not be able to bring your, uh, <clears throat> you tonight's program. Also, I wanted to give a big shout out to Sacagawea Audubon Society for, for providing their webinar platform for tonight's program. And lastly, this program is only running smoothly due to Lorene Reed's excellent technical support. If you have any problems, just put your questions into the chat and Lorene will be happy to help you. Now, before I introduce Dr. Kathy Whitlock, I wanted to let you know once again that you will have an opportunity to ask questions during her talk um, that she can answer once her talk is done. And to submit a question, you can either use the little raise your hand symbol on your control panel, or you can click on the question section and type your question into that area. With that said, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Kathy Whitlock. Dr. Kathy Whitlock is a Regents Professor Emerita of Earth Sciences at Montana State University and a Fellow of the Montana Institute on Ecosystems. She is nationally and internationally recognized for her research and leadership activities in the field of past climate and environmental change, particularly in the Yellowstone region. She is co-author of the Montana Climate Assessment, the Montana Climate Solutions Plan, and a recent report on climate change and human health in Montana. Kathy and the team recently, recently released the Greater Yellowstone Climate Assessment, the first report of its kind focused on an ecosystem. Kathy has received numerous awards and honors for her work, and in 2018, she became the first person from a Montana university to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences. So without further ado, Kathy, please take it away. Well, thanks so much, Ann, and, and thanks everyone for joining this event. Um, I think this is the benefit of Zoom, that it can be a snowy night in Bozeman, but we can all be together having a conversation about an important topic. So thanks for coming. And it's great to inaugurate the uh, 2022 Earth Day celebration. So I'm happy to do that. Um, so I wanted to talk about climate change in our region. And as you know, Internationally and nationally, there's a lot of reports about climate change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just last week came out with its 2022 report looking at the impacts of 
climate change on, on different sectors of society around the world. Um, the news is not really very good. Every four years, the U.S. Global Change Research Program comes out with the uh, a national climate assessment, and that's going to come out in the next year or so. But none of these assessments really um, bore down on what's happening locally, what's happening in our backyard, what does climate change mean for us? And I think that's really important because I don't think that people think there's a problem unless they can see how it's going to impact them. And so that was the motivation for developing another climate assessment, but this time focused on the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And this came out in July, in June. And like any of these assessments, um, its goal is to present the best science available at the time of publication in a form that everyone can understand. So it's a document that explains the science in a way that we can all start to discuss it and think about what it means. These assessments uh, take a couple of years to do and any project that you do in this region, you, you shouldn't do alone. It, it, it's not successful if you do it by yourself. You need to develop a partnership so that there's a broad base of support and interest in the activity. And in the case of the Greater Yellowstone Climate Assessment, we were working with federal scientists, uh, scientists from the universities in the region, the Park Service, nonprofits, uh, the tribal communities around Yellowstone, and also um, some businesses. So it's a huge partnership. It makes it complicated to keep all the balls in the air, but in the end, I think that's what leads to a successful assessment. And I think it's important that we think about what we're covering. So we're talking about the 22 million acres that has Yellowstone National Park at its center. This is a really complex jurisdiction, which made it fun to try to do a report. Uh, it's got public land, it's got private land, it's got federal, it's got state land, it's got three uh, Indian reservations, and it includes six major watersheds, um, including the Missouri headwaters where Bozeman is, the upper Yellowstone, the Bighorn, the upper Green, the Snake, and the upper Snake. Um, so it was a challenge to deal with all these jurisdictions. You've got three states where maybe climate change isn't the highest priority on their agenda, and we've got um, this very complicated landscape. But it's important to remember that we're not the first people here, right? And I just wanted to give you a land acknowledgement before I go too much farther. The lands and waters of Greater Yellowstone have been home to indigenous people for over 10,000 years, and over two dozen tribes consider Yellowstone to be part of their traditional homeland. We pay respect to these and other indigenous peoples with strong cultural, spiritual, and contemporary ties to this land, and we're indebted to them for their stewardship. Let's see. So tonight I want to talk about a little bit about what I do myself in my own research because it's what has brought me to Greater Yellowstone um, and why, why what I do has a perspective on this topic. And then I want to tell you about some of the information that's in the climate assessment about Yellowstone's past and future. And then maybe we can move into what we should do about it. I'm a paleoecologist which means that I study how the present landscape developed, what factors in the past have shaped the greater Yellowstone region and made it what it is today. So when I think about Yellowstone, my thinking starts 20,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. Yellowstone was completely covered by glaciers and 20,000 years ago, they started to melt away because the climate was warming. And it, ecologically, it was ground zero. There were no trees, there was no, there was no soil, no lakes, no wildlife. Everything that we see in Greater Yellowstone today had to have moved in and established in the last 20,000 years. So for me as a paleoecologist, I'm interested in 
what was the sequence of colonization? What, what species came in first, second, third? How sensitive were they to past climate change? What's been the role of fire in shaping the ecosystem through time? We get these answers by going to lakes. Lakes are great uh, repositories or collectors of environmental information because everything that falls on the surface of the lake has the potential to be settled to the bottom and be buried in the mud. Um, we go to lakes and we get vertical cores or you can think of them as tubes of mud that go from top to bottom. And the top layer of mud is laid down just recently, but we can go back layer by layer through time to the bottom layer of mud, which was laid down when the lake first formed. So in Yellowstone, when we get a core from a lake, we, we often get about 30 vertical feet of sediment. There's a lot of mud in most of our lakes. And when we radiocarbon date the mud, the bottom date is usually about 15 to 17,000 years, which is when the glaciers left the region and the lakes formed. We take these cores back to the laboratory and we slice them open. So here's a picture of a core sliced open and you can see the laminations, the different layers of this, of the left in the lake. And each of the colors represents a different kind of chemistry, which tells us something about the environment. We take samples from top to bottom in these cores and we treat them with different chemicals so we can see the different components that, that are in the mud. And then we look at those under the microscope, layer by layer. It takes a graduate student working on a lake about two years to fully analyze all of the, the sediments that we collect. So it's a very time consuming process. We, our group specializes in fossil pollen. Uh, different plants produce different looking pollen. And when you know the plants, then you know what the vegetation was. And when you know the vegetation, then you can reconstruct the climate. So pollen is probably the best fossil source that we have for reconstructing terrestrial climates and environments. There's a lot of pollen in lakes, uh, and it tells us a lot about the landscape. But we're also looking for uh, black particles of charcoal that tell us about the occurrence of ancient fires. And honestly, we're looking for anything we can find because every discovery, whether it's a piece of insect or a part of a bone, tells us something about the environment. Now I've worked on the history of temperate forests around the world at each of these locations, and these are extraordinarily beautiful places. Um, but always I think my heart and my thinking always comes back to Yellowstone. Um, Yellowstone for me is really a touchstone for trying to understand how ecosystems work, and, and it's been so interesting to compare other places to what I've known about Yellowstone. And this interest in Yellowstone for me goes way back um, I grew up in upstate New York, and every summer, uh, my brothers and I would get thrown in the back of a station wagon, and we'd travel across country to see the grandparents, and, and the stop in Yellowstone was always the highlight of the trip, and we'd feed the bears, and we'd go camping, and it was just a marvelous time, and when I went to graduate school, I realized for the first time that you could actually do research in Yellowstone. You could try to understand Yellowstone better by doing things like getting cores in mud. And when I came to Montana State in 2004, it's been so wonderful to be able to take students in the field and teach them about Yellowstone and to take graduate students out and undergraduates and show them how much fun it is to be a researcher in this region. One of the big things for me was the fires of 1988. Um, those of you that were around know that about 40% of the park burned that year, and the fires were a complete surprise to everybody. People hadn't seen anything like the 1988 fires. Uh, and so there was a lot of question about the precedence of those kinds of events. Have, we ever, have they ever occurred before? How often do they occur? Um, and so on. And one thing that I noticed is that the fire burned these very distinctive paths, and in the path were small lakes. 
Some of them were completely burned. Some of them were only partly burned. But those lakes seemed like a great opportunity to try to get a better handle on charcoal in late sediments. Could we look at the charcoal from the 1988 fire and understand how far charcoal traveled? How long did it take to be deposited in a lake? Um, how much charcoal indicated, did charcoal indicate area burned or fire severity? And so we spent the next 12 years going to lakes in burned and unburned watersheds, getting samples from shallow water to deep water and just measuring the charcoal. And from that work, we were able to develop a set of techniques to study fire history using charcoal data that are now used around the world. And there's now a global da charcoal database. It's publicly available. And it's really impressive. It's over 900 records. And each one of these little triangles is a lake or a wetland or an ocean core where someone has looked layer by layer at the charcoal and reconstructed the fire. You can see the coverage is good in the Americas and in Europe and in Eastern Australia, but we still have a lot of work to do in Asia and Africa. The point is though, is you can look at, you can reconstruct fire history from a single site, or you can look at a region or a continent, or even look at how fires have changed through time globally. So in Yellowstone, just to give you an example, Here's some of the lakes that we have pollen and charcoal records from in the greater Yellowstone region. And it's a pretty good network because it goes from low elevations to high elevations and um, north to south, covers a lot of vegetation types. And here's the charcoal, let me call it a composite from all of those records. So the black line, on the graph is the mean charcoal value and the gray is the scatter of data from the various plots. And this graph goes from present day zero back to 15,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age. And what it's showing you is here's the average, look at this as the average charcoal value of the last 15,000 years. There was very little charcoal from 15,000 to about 12,000 years ago. And this is because it's the end of the ice age and it's getting, it's cool, but it's getting warmer and there isn't a lot of vegetation. Then there's a time of really high fire activity, um, then low fire, a little bit lower fire activity, then a little higher. And the last uh, 6,000 years or so has been generally low in fire activity until 1988. So if you ask about precedents and you say, well, have we ever seen fires like 1988 before? It's important to know the time scale that you're asking the question, right? Because if you, if you ask for the last 150 years, for example, the period of the park, no, we haven't seen anything like 1988. It's definitely a high period. If we ask for the last, say, 7,000 years, then it's not so unusual. We had a lot of fires of that size around six to 7,000 years ago. And if you are really asking the question for the whole post-glacial 15,000 year period, then 1988 isn't really so unusual. We had extremely large or um, intense fires between 12 and 10. So time and space really change the answer to your questions and you really get that when you study paleoecology. And a paper just came out this summer, which I have to share um, with a former postdoc of mine. And here's the whole Rocky Mountain region, the whole Northern Rocky Mountain region. Here's the charcoal-based fire record. This is probably a record of area burned and you can see it's gone up and down. So let me back up. This is present day and this is zero BC. So fire's gone up and down and up and down. And then here we are now. The fire activity that we're seeing now since 2000 is just really off the charts for what's happened in the last 2000 years. And it seems to track temperature really well because here's the Northern Hemisphere temperature reconstruction. It was warmer during this period we call the medieval climate anomaly, lots of fires, cooler during the Little Ice Age, less fires. And then now we're in a warm period and there's lots of fires. Well, I think most people think about climate change because we've had so many weather climate disasters around the world. 
in the last decades. And um, now scientists are much better at attributing parts of those events to directly to the effects of climate change. So for example, the big floods that were in Germany and Belgium last year, probably about they probably about 19% of the severity of those events can be directly tied to global warming. In the same way, the area burned of, in the West, forest fires, probably almost half of the area burned can be directly attributed to, to global warming. And the same goes for things like the severity of hurricanes and really extreme precipitation events. So these disasters are taking human lives and they're costing us trillions of dollars every year. In our region, I think the thing that we're most aware of and right now think about with climate change is drought. Um, I got I just downloaded this today. Here's the, the drought um, monitor map for the US for this week. And you can see that Montana is almost completely in a drought state. And that was what Anne referred to in the cover of, on, the, on the newspaper today too. But almost all of Montana's in exceptional or extreme doubt. And it's been that way for almost 20 years. There's been some wet years in between, but it's sort of been the sustained drought. The other thing that we really get clobbered by is wildfire smoke right? And it's not always fires in our backyard. It's fires coming from um, California, Oregon, Washington. And we're very aware of climate change because of the smoke that we get in the summer and the, the dryness that we're experiencing now. So I think it's fair to ask, is the past the key to anything that we're seeing now or might see in the future? Let me answer that first on a large scale. Um, this is a paper that came out a couple of years ago looking at temperature reconstructions for the last 11,000 years. So this is present day and the, the data go back 11,000 years ago. So almost to the end of the ice age. These data come from pollen from the Northern hemisphere and the mean value of all of the, the temperature reconstructions is the black line and the pink is showing you the scatter. And there's some other data sets put on this graph as well. What it shows is that from about 11,000 to 7,000 years ago, the planet, the Northern Hemisphere was getting steadily warmer. This was the end of the ice age and temperatures were increasing. So negative values are colder than average, positive or warmer. And then in the last 6,000 years or so, the Northern Hemisphere has been getting generally cooler. So here's the mean temperature for the last 11,000 years. And the crazy thing is, here's the average for 2007 to 2016 when this paper was published. It's way above the mean. And here's the value for 2016. It's warmer than 99.4% of the reconstructed values. So yeah, we are looking at something that's quite unusual for the last 11,000 years and the last 20,000 years since the last ice age. We just haven't been it as, as warm as we are in this decade. And so I think it's fair to say that we are moving into uncharted territory for, on a 20,000 year time scale. The ice cores from Antarctica give us a longer perspective of climate change. You probably know that these ice cores have air bubbles in them and the, the bubbles trap the composition of the atmosphere at the time that layer of ice was laid down. So here the blue line is um, a record of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from these ice cores. And the blue is the temperature record for the Antarctica region. And, you, and what you see is, here's present day, here's 800,000 years ago. Um, when CO2 goes up, temperature goes up. When CO2 goes down, temperature goes down. And that's a pretty good relationship through time. And there's really kind of a band of variability. So when it goes up, we call all those warm periods interglacials. And we've had one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight in the last 800 years. They happen about every 100,000 years. And the in-between periods are, of course, the ice ages. Well, here we are now. We're into an interglacial as well. But all of a sudden, in the last few decades, last century or so, we've way exceeded the levels of CO2. We are, in fact, now at 415 parts per million CO2. So have we exceeded climate conditions globally of the last 800,000 years and CO2 levels? I think the answer is yes. It's pretty clear we have. As a paleoecologist, I asked myself, well, when was the last time we saw CO2 levels at 415 parts per million? And you have to go way back in geologic time. You have to go back 3.3 million years ago to find CO2 levels that are equal to those of today. And here's what this region looked like. It was about 10 to 15 degrees warmer. There was no ice in Greenland or Antarctica. Uh, and sea level was about 25 meters higher. It wasn't a bad place, but it was warmer and more humid and, and really quite a different place. Okay, thinking about this region, the greater Yellowstone, our landscapes have been shaped by climate change. And we shouldn't forget that. Climate change has been really important to the history of this ecosystem. So here's a picture of what Yellowstone looks like 20,000 years ago, 25,000 years ago during the last ice age. It was covered by a meter, sorry, a mile of ice in its center. And there were glaciers flowing down the valleys in all directions. It was very dramatically different than today. But these glaciers are responsible for our rugged mountains, our cirques, cirque headwaters, our gravel-filled valleys, our big meandering streams, our river terraces. We have been shaped by climate change. And it doesn't take much cooling to make Yellowstone look like this. When this when the when we were in the last glaciation, it was only about five to seven degrees Fahrenheit cooler. That's all it takes to make an ice age. Hmm. We can look at other other evidence of climate change in the Yellowstone region on a shorter time scale. We know that Old Faithful was shut down during a very prolonged drought that lasted from 1233 to 1362. Um, the reason for that is there was no precipitation. There wasn't enough um, precipitation getting into the groundwater to get to the plumbing of the geyser, and it just stopped erupting. And one of the things we know that during this period of time, trees actually grew on the geyser mound. So, Subtle changes can have big impacts on the way our ecosystem looks. And then a lot of people ask about the Dust Bowl. We know the Dust Bowl was quite a, a warm, dry period. And so here's temperature and drought information going from 2020, so now, back to 1900. Uh, and here's the temperature record. And you can see that the Dust Bowl had a couple of really warm years. But if you look at the average in the blue line, you can see that we're warmer than the Dust Bowl by quite a bit, and we have been since about 2000. So we are, we are warmer than the Dust Bowl. But here's the drought index. This is the Dust Bowl years again. The Dust Bowl featured several years, about a decade and a half of very dry conditions. And we have not seen that now. We are not at a drought level of the Dust Bowl. The difference is the Dust Bowl was dry, it was dry year round. It was dry in the winter and the summer. Whereas now what we're seeing is a seasonal shift in precipitation. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So just to wrap up about the long-term stuff, our recent temperatures, our recent averages are high, as high or higher than any period that we've seen in our region, in the last 20,000 years. The drought, however, is not as severe as other droughts in the past. Now, there are studies coming out that saying the present drought is as severe in other parts of the West, but it hasn't happened yet in what Yellowstone. In our recent levels of carbon dioxide, 
are higher than any period in the last 3.3 million years. Okay, let me move to a shorter time, time span in the past because I picked 1950 because a lot of us were alive then and we can kind of understand what the landscape was and think about how it's been changing. So in greater Yellowstone, it's gotten warmer. Sure, there's been warm years and cold years, but on average, Yellowstone is now 2.3 degrees Fahrenheit warmer uh, than it was in 1950. Our annual snowfall has declined. Again, sure, we get wet years and we get dry years, but on average, we're getting about 24 inches less of snowfall. Now, let me say this measurement really applies to elevations below 8,000 feet because it's coming from weather station data, and that's what they're measuring is, is snowfall at 8,000 feet and lower. Uh, we don't have the information for what snowfall is at higher elevations that can tell us about the whole ecosystem. Nonetheless, low elevations, we've had about a 25% decrease in snowfall. And the timing of our, our streams when they have the most meltwater, when they're at their highest flow, is now about eight days earlier than it was in 1950. So we are definitely in our lifetime seeing some pretty dramatic changes. The one thing, as I said, the timing of precipitation has changed a lot since 1950. So what we're seeing is that winter and summer are receiving significantly less precipitation than they used to in 1950. Uh, and on the other hand, spring and fall are getting wetter. So it's not that we're overall getting drier or wetter, it's just that the season in which it occurs has changed. And here's five streams from the Greater Yellowstone. And you can see how the stream flow has changed since 1950. So the blue bars going up is high stream flow and the red bars down is low stream flow, flow in terms of the percent change from 1950 to today. We now get most of our stream flow in May. In May well, I should say most of these streams are showing it in March, April, and May. Um, and then we go into uh, summers with less stream flow. So June, June through December are experiencing lower flows. It's not quite the same on every stream because they have different uh, catchments and different orientations to those catchments, but you can see the general shift is towards earlier in the season of high spring flow, of high stream flow. So since 1950, uh, it's gotten warmer on average by about 2.3 degrees. Our growing season is two weeks longer. That's a good thing. Uh, below 8,000 feet, snowfalls declined by 24 inches. Um, and annual stream flow is eight days earlier than it was in 1950. And it's spring and fall where precipitation has increased, whereas winter and summer has declined. Okay, well, that's all looking backwards. Let's look forwards to the future. And in the climate assessment, we took a fairly standard approach. What we did is we looked at scenarios of future greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions. Um, so we use the historical record of CO2 and then um, project into the future what how much CO2 is going to be emitted into the atmosphere. And these trajectories are developed at an international level and they're based on things like population growth and energy policy and estimates of economic trends, um, land use change, and that sort of thing. In our assessment, we took the international scenario called RCP 8.5, which is this real extreme case where CO2 just keeps rising through the century. This is considered extreme, and it's a case of what would happen if we didn't do anything to reduce greenhouse gases. We just continued to grow as we have been. Uh, 4.5, RCP 4.5 is this scenario, which most um, researchers think is the one that we're actually on, where we continue to use fossil fuels, but we start to slow down our use by the mid-century and we flatten the curve of CO2. 
And then there's other scenarios as well. Um, the none of these will get us to the um, the 1.5 degree threshold of of warming that we're trying to reach. That's a much lower, unfortunately, scenario of CO2 emissions. So we take these different levels of CO2 and we run them through 20 global circulation models. These these are climate models. Um, they were developed for weather prediction and they've become increasingly complex and comprehensive in the way they see the Earth system. So global circulation models not only just look at what's going on in the atmosphere, they're looking at ocean circulation and ocean temperature and cloud formation and what's happening with vegetation and cloud and um, sea ice feedbacks and so on. They're incredibly complicated and they have tens of thousands of um, ten, tens of thousands of bytes of computer code to run. There aren't that many global circulation models that are run in particular labs around the world. And we've taken 20 of those. And the global circulation model reconstructs the, our region in a very coarse kind of grid. Um, so it's not very precise. And so what we had to do for the Greater Yellowstone Climate Assessment is downscale it and look at it on a finer spatial grid like this in the middle um, so that we could actually see what's happening in our, in our ecosystem. And then we take the output of the global circulation models, we downscale them onto this grid, which is each little grid cell is four kilometers by four kilometers. We're looking at daily and monthly data. So you can just imagine how much data is involved in this exercise. So having said all that as background, let me show you some of the results. Um, here's the temperature record. So here's the mean temperature that we've had from 1900 to 2005. And the black line is the historic, so this is just documented record of temperature. And then these are the lines projecting us into the future. So you can see the overlap shows that the models are doing a pretty good job. And here they are into the future. This is the extreme scenario. And this is the stabilization scenario, the one we're more likely on. A couple of things to notice is that you have the, you have the median vote, um, result shown by the line, and then there's this scatter around each of the results, which is the 10th and 90th percentile of, of the results. Um, but the, the scatter gets broader as you go into the future because the models, you know, they're just extrapolating farther and farther in time and they get less and less um, sort of, um, there's more and more scattered around the results. Another thing to notice is that no matter which scenario we're on, we're going to be warming to 2050. And that's showing up globally as well as in the Yellowstone region. We're on this ride of warming um, no matter what we do till the middle of the century. And then depending on what we do now, we'll either get 10 degrees warmer, or if we're on this scenario, we'll get about five degrees warmer by the end of the century. Warming dries everything in Greater Yellowstone. All of the changes that we're seeing, I think are really directly related to this graph and the fact that we're getting warmer. First of all, we're gonna have more days over 90. We all love living in Bozeman because we hardly have any days over 90. Summers are great. But because of this warming, there's going to be more extreme days. And in the stabilization scenario, by the end of the century, it could be four to six degrees, four to six weeks of warming. If we don't do anything, it would be two to three months. But I'm optimistic. I think it's going to be this one. And this, this is the one that's really critical, I think, for us in water. Um, this is the elevation of snow and rain, and the yellow, orange, and red are the colors of slush, you know, kind of the weather we've been having lately. Uh, and we go from 2100, the end of the century, and it goes back to 1950. So what you can see is that in 1950, blue is snow, green is rain, this is slush. 1950, 
we had snow as the dominant form of precipitation down to 7,000 feet. Because it's warming, by the end of the century, that snow elevation line is going to be 10,000 feet. So it's getting warmer and warmer, and instead of snow, we're going to get slush and we're going to get rain. And that shows up on these maps of greater Yellowstone. So here's the reconstruction for 1990, say. Blue is snow. Here's 2030, 2050, 2070, and the end of the century. Because it's getting warmer, we're getting less snow, we're getting more rain. And that also means that the water that's in our snowpack, what scientists call the snow water equivalent, you know, it's how much, how much actual water, if you melted that snowpack, would you get, is declining. And it's declining in all of our watersheds. So here's the historic record in black. And then this is the stabilization scenario. And this is the extreme scenario. We're just losing our headwaters as we go through the century. And again, it's because of warming. And the other thing that's happening is the timing of runoff is continuing to change. So here's months of the year, and here's the watersheds. So this is for now, 2021 to 2040. This is for the end of the century. And what you can see is that we are already getting more runoff in March and April than we used to, and less in the, in the summer. And that, as we continue to warm, is going to only intensify so that most of our runoff will come in February, March, and April. And June, for example, and July will be quite dry. Okay, so the impacts of future climate change, some of them are good. Um, we're going to have a longer growing season. That's nice. Um, what we're seeing is a change in seasonal water availability. And so that's like a real decision-making space for people that are in agriculture. Is how are they going to deal with wetter springs, drier summers, um, wetter falls, that sort of thing. But in the end, it's summers that are going to be drier, and that's going to put a stress on a lot of agriculture. There's going to be, when you think about energy demand, um, there's going to be less energy demand for winter heating um, because it's going to be warmer in winters. So we're not going to have to have our heat quite so high. But because summers are hotter, there's going to be more demand for summer cooling. But overall, those don't quite balance each other out. Overall, there will be less annual demand for energy in this region. There's going to be less reliable snow conditions, especially the shoulder season. Um, and our stream flows will be lower and our waters will be warmer in summer. Those have implications for recreation. And then there's more fire at all elevations and um, a lot of terrestrial and aquatic changes. So the last part, I just want to just touch on what do we do about this information? I mean, I probably not all, this is all new to you. You've heard this before. I mean, the first thing we have to do is flatten the curve. And this we have to do globally, um, nationally, and also locally, right? That's the most important thing is reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. Uh, we want to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. When I look at this curve, I see my own life. Um, my parents lived their lives on the black line and they, they didn't see much climate change in their life. So it wasn't a very big issue for them. I started in the 1950s and I'm gonna live my life to the middle of the century. And I'm gonna see nothing but warming from here on out. Um, I, I think someone said the next five years are gonna be the coolest years of my life <laughs> because that's where we are. It's only in the last half of the century that we really can see changes happening. And this is where I think of my granddaughter. Um, she's gonna see so much change in her life and at such a rate that I can't even imagine what her life's gonna be like. And, and I wonder if she's 
even going to recognize the places that I that I love in Yellowstone um, when she starts to explore it. So it's it's not only a global problem; it's a, it's a deeply personal problem for all of us. This came out from Project Drawdown, which has an excellent um, website. We know the sources of greenhouse gases. This isn't a mystery, and here they're plotted by their global warming potential, but clearly it's carbon dioxide coming from fossil fuels, but there's other things as well. There's CO2 from land use. There's methane coming off of leaky gas lines. There's fertilizers that produce nitrates. There's chlorofluorocarbons from refrigeration. We know the problem. We know the culprit. And we also know where they come from. So it's not just an energy problem, although 62% of the problem is energy, but there's also it's also an agricultural problem and a transportation problem. It's cement industries and steel industries and buildings that are inefficient and refrigerants. It's it's a complicated problem, and there's a lot of places when we try to flatten that curve that we can tackle in um, seeking solutions. The other thing I think we have to remember is that not all of the carbon dioxide that we produce goes into the atmosphere. A lot of it, over half of it, goes into the ocean and the land. And we need to um, improve those sinks of carbon as well as go after the sources. We need to improve the sinks of carbon dioxide um, and make them more resilient and more robust. And so there's a lot of nature-based solutions, like defor not reducing deforestation, improving the quality of our soils, um, as well as technological solutions that are coming online. So I just put this list up. I'm not even going to read it because I think you know that there's a lot of things that we can do, some of them in the near term, some of them in the longer term to reduce our carbon footprint and lead to a, a, a you know a, a decarbonized society and that's what we're going to have to do that's that's ultimately what we have to do but at a local scale we also have to plan for change this is the adaptation part of the coin we have to understand that change is coming and we have to be ready for it. So what is it that we're gonna see in Greater Yellowstone? We're gonna to have to live with more heat and more drought and think about ways to do that. We're gonna be living with ecological change and already we're seeing that. Um, grizzly bears are on the move, wolverine populations are declining, toads and frogs are having a hard time in Yellowstone, white bark pine has had a massive die off, uh, birds come in before their food sources are available. The paleo record tells us that any time there has been climate change in the past, the ecosystem has to respond. And it's really important that we give our ecosystem the space to adjust to climate change, that we give plants and animals the space to accommodate the changes they're facing so that they don't go extinct. We're going to be living with wildfire. Um, not necessarily every year in our backyard, but somewhere in the West. We thought 1988 was a big deal, but we've seen ever larger fires ever since. And again, the paleo record tells us that whenever it's warmer, we get more fires. That's a very simple relationship. We also can see the consequences of wildfire. We can see that the trees that come back after wildfire aren't the same ones that burned. We can see that there's changes to our water quality. The snow melts sooner because the surfaces are black. There's a lot of feedbacks that go on just simply because we've burned the forest. And we're living with more uncertainty, right? Because you make the temperatures warmer, the snow uh, changes to rain, the snow melts off sooner, summers are drier. This puts huge stress on economies that depend on winter recreation. It also puts stress on municipalities and farms and, and ranches that depend on reliable supplies of water. And then there's health impacts. We did a whole report on this. Um, 
Warming in our area is going to be associated with an increase in health and smoke related illnesses, cardiopulmonary illness, water and insect borne diseases, and just mental health consequences of climate change. And of course, the most vulnerable populations are people who live in poverty, who live far from services, uh, people, the old and the young, people who have health conditions. And we wanna be sure not to leave anyone behind as we plan for climate change. And then I think very much, this is also an impact of climate change. More and more people are coming to this region Yellowstone in 2016, for the first time, had 4 million visitors, and it's had 4 million visitors ever since. People come here because they just have to get away from where they live because it's getting too hot, it's just intolerable, and they come here for their vacations. And that puts stress on our waterways, on our backcountry, on the infrastructure of our towns and our parks, um, and it's not gonna go away. And more people are moving here to get to enjoy the amenities. It's been said that Bozeman will have the population of Minneapolis by 2065. Can you imagine the population of Minneapolis in Gallatin Valley and the skyline that we might face? So again, what to do? Well, my, my small piece of the action is climate assessments. I think people need regular, and updated information on topics of concern. Um, and they need it in a timely way and they need it in a way that they can understand. Um, so we've done the Greater Yellowstone Assessment, the Montana Climate Assessment, Climate Change and Human Health. None of these are comprehensive. The Greater Yellowstone Assessment only looks at water and climate. It doesn't look at fish and wildlife, human health per se, uh, agriculture, economic factors. It's just the first of what I hope is many reports. But these have also led to what I think was a very good plan put together by the state of Montana, the Montana Climate Solutions Plan, which was put together by the last administration. But it had really good starting points for taking some actions in Montana that I think should be reconsidered and resurrected. We also have to get the word out. We have to talk to people. We have to talk to our families, our friends, our communities about climate change. In the last four years, I've been all around the state talking at town halls and round tables and been at rallies and talking to classes and nursing homes. You name it, any chance I get to talk about climate change, I will do so. I've been out in the field with Native Americans talking about things that they worry about we need to have this conversation. And here's my concern. This comes from Yale. Climate, it's their um, public opinion poll that they do regularly. Um, they ask the nation, how many adults think global warming is happening? The percentage is really high, it's really great. The percentages on this question have been increasing year after year, so that now, about 72% in the US think global warming is happening and it's even a little higher in Gallatin County. So that's great. What worries me is the next question, how many people think global warming will affect them? And there the percentages are just much lower, discouragingly lower. Um, Gallatin County, only half the people think it's going to affect them. In the nation, it's only you know 47%. Um, we need to we need to talk about this more. We need to make global warming be a local problem. In the climate assessment, um, the Greater Yellowstone Coalition conducted some surveys of participants around the region, asking them some basic questions. Asking them, do you have what concerns do you have? Uh, what impacts of climate change have you observed? What what information? Where do you get your information? And what would you like that you don't have? Um, what are you doing? And what? Um, how can we build more policy efforts to address climate change? So they did a kind of an informal survey. And the thing that came out over and over again was water. Everybody gets it. it water is gonna be a precious commodity that becomes more and more uncertain and more and more in short supply. And while there's these other issues going on, they're all threaded together by water. 
And in fact, I was really moved. One person in the survey said, they said more information and data is a big need. The awareness is already there, but we need more information and tools in the toolbox. And I would add to that, we just need to talk about this topic more. So I'll just close with that. You know, Yellowstone's celebrating its birthday this, I guess this month, uh, its 150th birthday. And there's gonna be a lot of talk about what's happened in the last 150 years and the good decisions that have been made and the really heroic efforts that have, have, have been um, accomplished or, or undertaken. But I really think we need to be careful and turn the spotlight to the next 150 years, the 150 years in the future, because every decade that goes by, we're going to have to go farther and farther back in geologic time to find anything that makes any sense for what we're seeing. Um, that's very discouraging. And we're also going to have to have a conversation. This is a singular ecosystem. It's the last nearly intact, pristine ecosystem in temperate latitudes in the world. And we have the special responsibility, I think, to leave the wildlands and our wild rivers and waterways in good shape for the next generation. So thank you. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Kathy. That was just so informative and so interesting. And I'm speaking for everyone, but I really appreciate it. It was so good. Um, so now if if you were opening up um, uh, the talk to questions. So, um, so if you can just put your questions into the, um, put your questions into the question box. Or you can raise your hand if you go um, over to your control panel. And uh, you, and I am looking right now to see if anyone has put up their hand. And I will, you can unmute them, you, and, and then you can ask the question yourself. So um, let me just look more here and see what questions are showing up in our question box. While we're waiting, Kathy, I know I had one question. I had heard um, someone else talking about this um, a few months ago, and, and they were making the point that because we have um, our snow melting earlier, that a lot of the water was actually leaving our, our own ecosystem, our system, and going out of the state. Did I get that correct? Because I, was, I had never thought of that before. Well, you know, Yellowstone is the headwaters for the Colorado, mm -hmm. the Snake, and the Columbia, and the Missouri. So all the water that comes from our headwaters eventually flows out of the state and into the oceans. Um, it's incredibly important region is hydrologically. And so, you know, what you're saying is true. You know, when the snow melts earlier, it's going somewhere. It's going downstream. The other and thing... Then and we don't get the use of it is that it as much as oh, other people yeah. downstream oh that's right okay okay it's lost, to oh. us. It's lost to us because it flows away and it also evaporates yeah okay so i'm getting some questions in here now um doug um asked kathy have there been any projections on the impacts that the war in ukraine will have on climate change <laughs> boy good question i'm I'm asking myself that as well. And I just, you know, I, I've read editorials and I agree with the fact that I think it shows how dependent the world is on fossil fuels right now. You know, that wouldn't it be nice to be in a world where that wasn't the case, where we had um, our own supplies of energy and we weren't, we weren't looking at this global balance that was being controlled by Russia. And the other thing is Ukraine is such a food basket for several parts of the world. And what's going to happen to these other parts of the world where agriculture is so fragile? And then, and then I was thinking, and no one's really talked to me about this, but you know, we have winter wheat here, and Ukraine is a wheat capital as well. And I'm just thinking about the complex space of wheat markets in the world. You know, how is what's happening in Ukraine with the loss? probably of their wheat exports going to mean for for Montana. We're all connected. 
that's for sure. Very interesting. Um, okay, on to our next question. Um, Max, Max asks, how do you res how do you respond to folks who say there is no such thing as climate change? I I think there's people that are so much in denial phase that they're not interested in anything. They're not interested in hearing about anything. And so those aren't the people that you necessarily are going to be very successful in trying to talk to. But there's this broad group of people in the middle that don't think about it, or they don't have much information, or they don't really try to put together what they're seeing today with, with any kind of long-term trends. And I mean, I'm very heartened that 72% of the of the country gets it, sees climate change. When I talk around the state, I I always try to understand people's experiences that have lived here a while and, and try to get an impression of what they've observed. And almost everywhere I've talked, people notice that it's getting warmer. That's that's an observation that every farmer I've talked to observes. And that I figure I don't need to give them the most technical details. If we can agree that climate's changing, we can have a conversation. Thank you very much. Um, one more question here, and then I see um, Carl's raised his hand, and after this next question, we'll have Carl unmute himself and ask his question. Um, this is from Jesse. This year was projected to be a strong La Nina, La Nina, historically a cool, wet winter for us. Not exactly what we are seeing. Random chance or a breakdown in the ENSO. Maybe you know what that means. <laughs> so that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer. One thing that um, climate scientists have found is that ENSO, this La Nina, El Nina um, variability that we get on interannual timescales, is not particularly good at predicting the climate of greater Yellowstone or even most of Montana. It does better in Western Montana predicting like precipitation levels, but in most of Montana, it's not a very strong relationship. And it's such a simple way to predict, you know, it's like kind of farmer's almanac kind of thing, because you can predict ahead, but it's not very accurate in our region. Um, and so we did not get a very strong La Nina this year. Uh, we were all hoping it would bring more snow, but that's just, you know, go to go to British Columbia, go to uh, northern northwestern Washington. That's where they're getting it. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, Carl, um, you, I see you've raised your hand, and um, if you can, I've unmuted you. So if you, Carl, are you there? Would you like to ask your question to Kathy? Okay, uh, thanks for the talk, very good talk. Um, so I live in the Flathead watershed, uh, grew up in the Clark Fork watershed. I'm just curious if those trends that you noticed in terms of increasing precipitation in the spring and fall and decreasing precipitation in the winter and summer, I don't know if you have any information in terms of whether that applies to the broader Northern Rockies region and at places outside of the Yellowstone watershed. Yeah, Carl, it does actually, and I I, I, um, I recommend the Montana Climate Assessment where we looked at northwestern Montana as a, as a region. We'll give you some of that information, but it's really the seasonality that's changing. You know, it's it's getting just a little wetter in the springs, um, drier in the summer, and that's statewide. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. We appreciate that. Um, here, um, Megan has another question. She says, I see a lot of coal coming through Livingston and Bozeman on the trains. Do you know where this is going, i.e. used for power in Montana or exported, and or how to understand more about energy use and needs in the state? Wow, you're getting beyond my expertise. I see those trains too. and. I always assume they're going to Asia. Eventually, that coal's going to Asia. Um, but I would save that question for Rich Reddy, who's speaking uh, next, because he'll he'll know the answers to those kinds of questions. 
Uh, yes, and so I encourage you to, if you haven't already, to register for his talk. You can um, get that from the handout today or go to our website. Uh, one more question here from Jeff. He says, are there any predictive models that would show when in the season at certain at, at a certain annual precipitation level and runoff timing would result in the Yellowstone River running essentially dry in the late season? Or are there models that show the, de the decreasing level of base flow due to the same factors? Do I need to re-ask re that or did you get it? Yeah, it's sort of like, do we know how much sort of base flow or groundwater input these river systems get that might keep them f with water even even when it's dry um can can there be some base flow or groundwater flow and and do we have that modeled i think that's your question in a kind of a flipped way um and the answer is we we don't have good models, and and I think that's a real area where we need some more research. Um, most of the models just look at surface water, and there's very few watersheds anywhere, but I don't think there's any in Yellowstone where we actually can fully model the water cycle in a watershed. You know that we can look at snow, groundwater outflow, evaporation in a totally complete way, and that's that's a huge gap in information. Thank you, Kathy. Um, let's see, I'm just looking through here. I know we've had some thank yous for a great talk. Uh, there are a number of people um, with organizations, they're part of organizations that um, are also working to encourage people to talk about climate change. So I'm just giving a shout out to them, Families for a Livable Climate. Um, we're giving a shout out here as a local nonprofit doing work to encourage people to talk about climate change and share their stories. Um, so that's a good organization to learn more about. Um, Alex is talking about Citizens Climate Lobby, and they also um, are working for solutions to propose a carbon fee and carbon cashback. So you can go to Citizens Climate Lobby to find out more about that solution. Um, so uh, let's see, let's just, I'm just looking to see if I've missed any questions here. Okay, let's see. We have Jesse, okay. um, who's got his hand up, Jesse. Yeah, Jesse had his hand up also, but we already covered a question from Jesse, I think earlier, is that a different, maybe that's a different Jesse though. So uh, thanks, Lorene. Um, Jesse, um, can we unmute you? And then uh, would you like to ask your question? Are you there, Jesse? Maybe we've lost Jesse. Okay, I've got um, one more question here and then maybe we'll wrap up. Um, is creating snow at ski resorts because of lack of snow bad for watersheds? Hmm, I'm not an expert in that. So I, um, I, I think it's a short-term solution for one thing. Um, because it's gonna, it's, there's gonna have to be more and more investment in that. I know around in other places in Europe, for example, they invest a lot in making snow. I think it depends on, um, you know, what the sources are, how contaminated they are, how much nutrients you're putting in and taking out when you do that. Uh, what's the energy use? What kind of energy sources are you using to make the snow? And uh, who are you taking the water from? Okay, thank you so much. All very good questions and uh, thank you. Very good answers, Kathy. Uh, Loreen, do you see any more questions here or, or do you think we're about ready to wrap this up? We are getting past our hour. Our, um, usually we aim to be about an hour and we're a little over that with all this good discussion. So uh, maybe we'll move on here to do just a little wrap up. Kathy, thank you so much. Really appreciated this again. It was just so interesting to hear um, all this very pertinent information. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, so anyway, uh, as I said, we you will be getting a follow up email um, and look for that um, with a link to the recording of this talk. 
Um, and it will also include some information about some future events. And uh, we've already mentioned this a few times tonight, but now that you've learned what the future may hold for our snow and water, you may be interested in finding out what we can do um, to help the situation to lower emissions. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, to register for our next talk, which is Tuesday, March 22nd at 7 p.m. Um, in his talk, What Can Be Done About Climate Change and How Much Will It Cost on March 22nd, Dr. Richard Reddy, an economist at Montana State, will be discussing different policy tools that we can use to reduce and reverse greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you can download the hand, handout that's uh, over there in the control panel to get more information. You can also visit our website at www.gallatinvalleyearthday.org to register for that talk. Uh, just to give you a heads up, we do have a number of very interesting um, additional online events coming up in April. Um, for instance, how a gray water system can cut your water use, usage dramatically, which is on Wednesday, April 8th by Randy Hafer. Um, and then we also have a screening and discussion of the film Drop, um, which was produced by Patagonia and uh, Hillary Hutchinson. And uh, we will have a discussion after the um, screening of the movie um, with our um, Trout TV star, Hillary Hutchinson, and world champion and Olympic skier, Hillary Lind, and executive director of Montana Trout Unlimited, David Brooks. So don't miss that. That's on Wednesday, April 13th. And you can check our website to register for that talk. Um, we have lots going on in April, a lot of in-person events coming up. Um, Maureen, I'm reading my, I don't know if you've put up the screen yet, but if you haven't, if you'll do that, uh, here's a little summary. Um, please join us to celebrate Earth Day in person at the Emerson Center for the Arts. We have a really interesting, fun program with some very special guests. There'll be food and drink and a social, social hour at 6 p.m. before that, and the program starts at 7 p.m. And then the next day, we have two fantastic events going on here in Bozeman. Um, the second annual Earth Day run will be Saturday, April 23rd at the Gallatin County Regional Park. That starts at 9 a.m. And after that, head on over um, because at 10 a.m., um, our annual Earth Day Festival will be happening at the Emerson Center for the Arts and Culture, where there'll be food, live music, exhibits, talks every hour, and lots of children's activities with prizes, including a puppet show. So if you'd like to keep up to date on Earth Day activities, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter on our website. So thank you so much for joining us and have a good night. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you.